This is a strange head for a fish, but this is a very common fish in Michigan, not this size. This at one time was a world record. Captain Emil Dean caught this one by accident. We're gonna show you some footage in a little bit of uh, some commercial fishing off Marquette, where I swear they catch fish like this almost every day. We're also gonna talk about white deer. Now this is a white fawn we showed a couple weeks ago on the air, but we're gonna show you some adult white deer. We have a great recipe for shore lunch. I mean, unlike one you've ever tasted before, and we have a lot more, so you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost, it's time for The Practical Sportsman. A couple weeks ago, John Ford and I went fishing with Faye Williams off Marquette in Lake Superior. We were trying to catch the lake trout that came in to feed on the smelt along shore, 20 to 30 feet of water. On our way out, we spotted a commercial fishing boat pulling trap nets, the kind of nets that fish swim into but can't find their way out of, sort of like a, a fly trap. Now, these nets allow the commercial fishermen to sort out the fish they can keep and toss back the other fish that they can't keep unharmed. Now this commercial boat was looking for white fish, a table delicacy, but about 40 percent of what they were catching was lake trout with an occasional northern pike mixed in. Now these were these were big lake trout too, which proved to us that the fish we wanted to catch were there. This net is called a trap net, so the fish swim into it and get caught and can't get out, sort of like a live trap. Well, what is your name? Ted Phil. Head Phil, yep. and you have been uh, you've been a commercial fisherman up here how long? Uh, 25 years. No kidding. Yeah. Family business? Yeah. Uh, Dad started it. And of course he was using gill nets in the old days. Right. And trap nets too. Oh, were you? Oh yeah. I started off with trap nets. So you set this trap net out here, uh, and the buoys are around it, marking where it is so the fishermen don't. Yeah. Well marked. We all mark them. And you catch white fish at this time of year? White fish. Yeah. That's all the fish. Just so the white fish. Just the white fish. Yeah. You, you did. I see you take. Here's a sucker. Well, suckers and carp you can keep. Yeah. Sportsmen use those for big fishing bait. Now that's a that's a long nose sucker. I'll be darned. I mean, people fish a long time and never get to see something like that. And you got a big carp in one of these. Yeah. Yeah. You can keep so those too. Is this this is your stack of fish from this one net? How many yeah. nets do you run? Uh, we run up to 20 nets. Oh, no kidding. So you got you have some work to do yet today. Oh yeah. How many do you check every day? Oh, usually 10. Ten a day? We just check them twice a week. Pretty good catch today, or? Yeah, it's, it's about an average for this time of the year, yeah. What kind of price do you get for them? Oh, that varies. Anywhere from 50 cents to a dollar, you know. A pound? Yeah. We pay a lot more than that when we buy them. Oh, yeah. The yeah. Store. yeah. Well, Ted works this boat with Bob White, his assistant. They run about 20 trap nets, which provides a living and provides fish for many supermarkets and restaurants. For the trophy book, look what I caught. Yeah. Oh, look at the lake trout. Whoa! Well, I thought the few minutes we spent aboard the Linda Lee were fascinating. It proved there were lots of big lake trout and whitefish right where we were fishing. I'd love to catch whitefish like that. But except for these commercial fishermen who use nets, whitefish can be extremely difficult to catch on hook and line. Captain Emil Dean caught this one that's on display at our museum, and for several years, this was the state record. You can see it's small mouth, it's a tender mouth, and usually takes finesse to bring a whitefish to the boat. Now let's go back to the Upper Peninsula and check out a tourist attraction where you can see some extremely unusual white-tailed deer. If you take US-2 west of St. Ignace, just a, a mile or two outside of town, you're gonna find the Deer Ranch. Harold and Sally Creasy raised deer here for public display. Quite a place, quite a gift shop, but the main thing back here, we're gonna we're going to do something that most people don't get to do, huh, Harold? Yeah, I think so. Okay, we're going to open the gate and get in next to this white deer. Ooh, buck is getting a little spooky. Now, this is not an albino buck, but it's a white buck that has been bottle raised, so it's not afraid of people. Little concerned. Boy, look at the nose on that, John. The, the nose is uh, partly pink and partly black. But one thing you notice about that deer, it has black eyes, which makes it not an albino. I'll, uh, I wonder, do you think I can get in here, Harold? Yeah, he might stay there. As long as his camera stays back, he's, he's liable to stay there. A little bit camera shy. Now, how old is this buck? He's three years old. He's a three-year-old buck. Come out of Pennsylvania. 
He got his antler injured just a little bit. We transferred him last week, and uh, he was fighting with the other one here, and he got a little blood on it. But uh, but these antlers, as they come out, they're pink. Yeah, they'll be pink, and uh, he should be. Last year he was a six-pointer. We hope this year he'll be an eight-pointer. Now, you just touched those antlers of his. Yeah, they're really, if you feel them, they're really hot. They're full of blood. Just, hot? Just feel them. They're real hot. Ooh. Man, they are. Mm -hmm. So when they get injured, they'll bleed real bad. They're full of blood. Mm -hmm. They grow about a half an inch a day. But but I, I a half inch a day, that's quite a yeah. bit. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought that they were very tender. Uh, yeah, they are tender. That's why if they bump them, they'll bleed them real bad. But, I mean, you were able to grab them, and that buck didn't mind. No, they're not tender to, you know, the way I touch them. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they scrape them against a tree, they're just tender to uh, uh, the skin on them will break real easy. Wow. Now, this white buck, uh, you, you have had albinos before? Uh, no, this is a, last year was the first year we got a white one. We have another one in the pen somewhere around here. Well, there's a buck right up there, I see. He's a two-year-old. Uh, we got him first, and uh, then I had a chance to get this guy, and so we got him. So they won't be together this fall. We'll have mm -hmm. to separate them. And, uh, but we're going to use them for breeding and hope we'll get some white fawns. Now, these, these white fawns not being albino means that they live a lot longer. Right. right, they'll live about 12 years. We're albinos. Probably in captivity, we might get five years out of them. We haven't, uh, we just don't want to pay that kind of price to, for five years. So we got this one, so he'll last about 12 years. Mm -hmm. huh. so we're just experimenting a little bit and uh, just to have something different for the public. A lot of people, you know, have never seen a white deer and he's really shedding. Boy, too. he's shedding that. Yeah, so the they, winter, a the white deer will. Is going. Yep, the ha, they have a winter coat as well. Yep, his winter coat is going. You can see I'm picking it right off. Wow. And uh, should get out here with a hairbrush, I guess. He doesn't seem to have a lot of hair. No, no, it'll get real thin. The summer hair is real thin, so. But this, is this his winter coat, or did this he have more? This is his winter coat, yeah. Well, it's, he's lost a lot of it. Oh, he doesn't feel at all, uh, the, 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 the texture of this hair doesn't feel as, as thick as a no, Normal it, it don't. It don't. It, I think it's because it's white. Maybe mm -hmm. that's what does it. it. It makes it a lot finer hair. So probably there's survival mm -hmm. in the wild, white deer, because of the their coat. Like of course, right. also they're uh, obvious for predators. Yeah, obvious. Uh, especially their fawns are very obvious if they're born out in the wild. Now, why does I an albino find... only live for five years? Well, with the pink eyes, they have no immunity system, so they are actually they're. Uh, so once they get sick once they get any kind of sickness and usually we have them around here out in the wild and you'll see them for about two years and then they'll just disappear nobody mm -hmm. knows where they go but they just die off now these deer back here are keeping their distance have they been bottle fed these two i raised at the house last summer they were bottle fed uh they're a little bit leery of humans too but uh they'll come up and around once they get used to people they oh, they see. don't seem to like cameras for some reason i think right? it's a reflection they see in the lens Huh. And uh, but these two were bottled. That's probably fed. why I don't get big deer with you that very right. often, John, <laughs> because of that lens. Yeah, they see another deer in there or something. That's now my you excuse. Know why you don't get them. That's, that's mm -hmm. my excuse. Mm -hmm. Boy, that's something else. Yep. Now the feet on this deer the, are kind of splayed out. The hooves. Yeah, they're a little bit different. All different deer have different hooves. Uh, I, in fact, when don't I like me getting down like that. No, actually, I trimmed a little bit off when I brought them from the house over here. Mm -hmm. uh, they were a little bit too long, but he'll get in the rocks here, and they'll wear right down, or they'll chunks will break off. So mm -hmm. we don't worry too much. There's enough rock in here, but I did trim them a little bit. Uh, Very we, interesting. You gonna have any white fawns here? Well, year? we have uh, Betty here, which is she is standing over here. She's pregnant now. Betty is not that. That's that doe right there. That's a doe right there. She's not white. She's not white, but she has about a 65% chance of throwing a white fawn, which because happened last year. She threw a white fawn and a brown fawn. Because she's being uh, bred to a white buck. She's bred to a white buck. She has quite a bit of white on her, uh, so that's one of the reasons I put her in here. Mm -hmm. She had four white feet, and it looks like she'll uh, give a... Oh, well, she does have white uh, yeah. yeah, she's got a lot of white, and that was a good... Uh, good way to do it. I have some deer that's got a lot of black on them and I thought, mm -hmm. well, that isn't a good way to do it. So we'll try one with white. We were successful last year, but it did die of pneumonia, which is down in your museum mm -hmm. now. And uh, we're hoping this year, maybe we can keep them alive. If I have to bring them home, they're gonna stay in the bedroom with us. 
Sometimes these white-tailed deer are quite arduous to take care of. This cold weather we've had has not been good for the fawns that have been dropping in the wild. But Harold does have fawns up there now, including a white fawn that was born about a week ago. Remember, you can't go in the pens like we're doing right here, but uh, you can see them from the outside. These deer are fascinating. This is the white fawn that Harold was referring to. You can see in this freeze-dried mount where its neck was shaved so veterinarians could put in IVs to try to save it from viral pneumonia. But it only lived a week despite expert medical care. Well, you can see this fawn mount at the museum along with an extremely unusual display of turkey feathers which we ran across in our recent trip to the Upper Peninsula. Well, this is a picture of Pat Muffler from Marquette and the turkey he got in 1990. Now, Pat's brother was a taxidermist and taught him a few things. And Pat's in the upholstery business, so we combine upholstery with taxidermy. And he has, well, like a rug, a cape of his turkey. This was his 1990 wild turkey. There's his, his license. And here are the spurs off of that bird, fairly substantial spurs, the beard quite an unusual treatment of a wild turkey. I think a lot of people would like that, Pat. Come on in here, tell me about this. Well, I just, uh, when I shot that one back in uh, 1990, I got looking at it and I thought, well, I don't wanna throw all those feathers away. They were too pretty to do that to. So I caped it out and you know, just mixed a little bit of upholstery work with it at the same time. And that's what I come up with. And Where'd you get the idea for this? Well, uh, Did you one like it somewhere? <laughs> No, not really. I just, uh, of course, I did a lot of uh, bird skinning with uh, ducks and so forth, so I knew skinning the bird was no problem. And, uh, of course, I had the upholstery part of it licked, and I, mm -hmm. like I said, I just put them together, and that's what I come up with. And for, as soon as I did one, I had a lot of people commenting on it, so I thought, well, next year I'll probably do the same thing, and I've been doing it every year. So. And now you have the birds here. Look at this, John, we have birds. These are the birds that you and your buddy got this year? Yeah, yeah, I shot the one here on the left. He's he's sporting about a nine inch beard here. Wow. And uh, I got now, him. Let, let's take a look inside. What do we have inside okay, here? Well, it's, it's just, uh, I've got to put the, the cure on it yet. Uh, it's a little wet, I just caped it out last night. But I, I rub it down with a borax solution, mm -hmm. uh, get all the fat out of it. And now, do you have to do some more skinning past this uh, point? No, the borax the borax will pull all of this off of there. You, mm -hmm. you get this on the, around the neck of the turkey from the waddles and stuff. And, uh, of course, you get a little blood shot from shooting them in the head. But um, the borax solution will, will mm -hmm. take care of all that. And uh, just before it's completely dry, um, I start mounting it on the board. And um, well, I you have You have all the... The different parts of the turkey here. Yeah, this, this is, is this is the, the chest. This uh -huh. is the one side of the chest. I skin them right from the right. Uh, right from the rear end, right up through the belly, and right out the bottom of the neck. I mean, the iridescence off of those feathers. I, I hope yeah, the light just, can pick that up because that they are beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what move. got me. That's what got me going. I thought, boy, I, I'm not a fly tire, so I mm -hmm. can't do that. Well, turn this turn this uh, chair around here. That okay. you have. You just have it sitting on a chair right now. Yeah. And of course, here's the tail. Yeah, and then you here. got when I uh, when I mount these, I pack this underneath here, so I get these get these feathers to stand up. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I tack tack my tail out and everything on them. Have it fanned out. Yeah, once. and uh, of course, yeah. once it dries, it only it's only a matter of about a week before it's completely dry. So it's not a it's not a long process. It's just a kind of a tedious one. <laughs> so you cut out. This is probably plywood or something yeah, behind here. Yeah, just a piece of like three eighths inch plywood. And uh, when I upholstered, of course. Yeah, yeah. When I uh, when I did the first turkey, I I laid it out. I had it on a piece of plywood because I had it tacked out when mm -hmm. I was skinning it. So I just I just outlined it, uh, outlined it big enough that I can get every turkey on one. So then when I got to do another turkey, I just plop one of these boards on oh. there and. Now, what is it that's underneath here? Uh, it's a mixture of uh, cotton and polyester padding under there, and I just pack just it under real tight. The, push the feathers out. Yeah, and then I, I tack it down around the sides. and. Huh. Very interesting. I bet you a, a, an awful lot of hunters would like to give this a try or oh, learn yeah. how to do this. This yeah. is something else. How long does it take to skin one out? Uh, it takes me about 35, 40 minutes to skin one. Oh. And uh, let's skin it and... Uh, Usually I fillet the breast out of them and cut the legs off. We, we usually bake our turkeys mm -hmm. and, you know, and, uh, with a dressing and stuff rather than roast them. So. 
Oh, that baked turkey sounds good, and Pat Muffler's turkey rug looks good. Something you turkey hunters might want to try with your next bird. Pat loaned us this one, uh, put on display at the museum, so you can see exactly how it's done. Coming up is a recipe, a fish recipe, you're absolutely going to want to try. This dish, believe it or not, is a shore lunch. Now, you usually think of a shore lunch as something that you fry fish, and, and this is walleye, mm -hmm. This is good Lake Erie walleye. Lake Erie Walleye, he says that because he's from Napoleon, Ohio. And come up here and give us some of your good Lake Erie Walleye that you caught there. But this, this is an oddball shore lunch. I mean, first of all, it's in foil. Mm -hmm. But that's how you cook it? Yeah, we, uh, we got tired, the group of guys that I go out fishing with up in Canada, we got tired of having fried fish all the time for lunch. Now hold it, hold it. You said... Okay, this yeah. is this is Lake Erie. This walleye, is Lake Erie, but, but we you go use, up in Canada. Yeah, we go up in Canada fishing every year for a week. Some kids, some guys that I went to college with, and we got tired of the fried fish, so we devised this recipe because it's so easy. You just use foil and basically uh, that recipe mm -hmm. sauces, and when you're done, that's the only mess you got to clean up. You can roll the foil up and put it in a jar, and away you go. Now this isn't a commercial here for this. <laughs> Whatever kind, we'll take that Betty Crocker off of there. Recipe sauces. I mean, it's, what, what is this? This is just. Yeah, it's like a sweet and sour sauce. It's got, I think, uh, it says add, pineapple add and chicken, different things. beef, or pork right there. <clears throat> we use fish. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about, the people who make it. Then you put an onion, sliced an onion, yeah. put it on top, and over the campfire. Yeah. You take a grate, and you put it over, you build a fire, and you put a grate over the fire, you have Build your foil and set it right on a grate and let it cook for 20 minutes and it just comes mm. right out. Ooh. Have you had this? Tricia? I'm going to in just a minute. Mmm. This is. Very good. Mm -hmm. But you say there's other sauces that they make that you can yeah, try? Yeah, we've never really tried. We've tried just regular pineapple or peaches in this recipe mm -hmm. and we found out that the recipe sauce works best. Mmm. Uh, it's sweet, you know. Mm -hmm. The guys I go with, they like, you know, a little sweeter sauce, but it. Turned out pretty good. Hmm. What do you think, Trish? Oh, by the way. Well, you got me with my mouth full. <laughs> well, this is this is Trisha Johnson, who's the membership coordinator of yes. the Federation of Sportsmen and a practical sportsman here. It's very good. It is. I like this food. Mm -hmm. Because we couldn't we couldn't get you to do a venison recipe. No. That's not your favorite. <laughs> no, but fish, you can fish anytime. And what do you think of this combination of sweet and sour with the fish? Oh, it's great. Mmm. You can taste the fish, everything. This recipe can be found in the June-July issue of the Practical Sportsman magazine, which came off the presses on June 1st and is mailed to all Federation of Michigan Sportsman members. This edition contains all the fish and game recipes you see featured on TV during June and July. This week, let's feature channel catfish in our trophy book. Mark Wilson from Pullman caught this 28-incher from Allegan County's Scott Lake in March. Now, this nine-pounder came from the Grand River in July. Jim Mewson from Lowell caught it at midnight using a bluegill for bait. Wolf Lake in Muskegon County produced this nine-pounder for Russ Van Klompenberg from Nunica. He caught it in July on a minnow. Bob Hendrick from Fairgrove was fishing the Quanacasee River in Tuscola County, middle of May, using a night crawler. This was just after lunch. He hooked and landed this 10-pound channel cat. Arthur Robinson from Detroit caught this big channel cat in Lake St. Clair using a minnow, probably fishing for walleye because it was 1.30 in the afternoon on May 2nd. This 29-inch catfish weighed nearly 13 pounds. Now, a 13-pound channel cat is a big one. But can you imagine catching one more than twice this weight, almost a foot longer? Nadine Eviuge from Adrian hooked one. This is a channel catfish. You got a worm, caught it on a worm, Long Lake up in Alpena County. 37 inches, 30 pound channel cat. That, that is awesome. You must have been excited to catch it. Yeah. Well, tell me about it. What was it? Were you fishing for catfish? Yeah, we got up at about seven. We went out fishing at 8.45, me and my dad and my brothers. Now, is this in the morning or the evening? Yeah, morning. Huh. And my dad, I kept on telling my dad something's on my line, so he took it and he said it's probably a rock, so, and he found this on it. Now, did he reel it in or did yeah, you? He oh, he it. did. But since you hooked it, and you hooked it right here on this, yeah. this hook right there, 
You hooked it, you get the credit for the 30 pounder. Nadine, right? Yeah. Congratulations on this. How about that? That 30 pound channel catfish was 37 inches long, caught in Alpena County's Long Lake at the end of July. Now this mount will be on display in the trophy area at the Practical Sportsman Museum until the end of July. And for hooking this fish, we'll put Nadine Eviuge in the spotlight as our Practical Sportsman Catfish Angler of the Week. No matter what you want to do outdoors, there's two ways to look at the weather. Cold weather keeps the mosquitoes down, warm weather's a little more comfortable. Hey, get outdoors anyway, it's a great place to be. See you next week.